Hey, how's it going, everybody? Sean here for another movie review, and today we got a fan request. We're going to be talking about Six String Samurai from 1998. This was requested by The Fractal Curve, so here you go, buddy. Thank you for making the recommendation, and thanks for being supportive of the channel. Um, it's directed by Lance Mungia, written by Jeffrey Falcon and Lance, Lance Mungia. Stars Jeffrey Falcon, Justin McGuire, Kim D'Angelo, Stephane Gauger, and others. The plot synopsis is, in the post-apocalyptic world of 1960s Nevada, a rock and roll samurai on his way to Las Vegas takes a young orphan boy under his protection as death and his metalhead horsemen chase after them. So yeah, this is kind of a, it's kind of a cool movie. It's got a really cool tone. It's very unique. It's got its own kind of completely kind of world and own vibe to it. It's like if you took mixed rockabilly sensibilities with, the world of Mad Max. There's a lot of like similarities to something like the Road Warrior. I would say even the main character, uh, played by Jeffrey Falcon, Buddy. Uh, he looks like Buddy Holly, but he acts like Max uh, from Mad Max. He's very like you know a man of few words, the reluctant hero. He has a good heart. He has a good moral compass, even when he doesn't really want to acknowledge that. You know, and that's kind of the the character's arc. He takes this young orphan under his wing reluctantly to to bring him with him to Las Vegas so he can find somebody for himself. And um, I, I have some history with this movie. I saw it when I was a teenager. I remember when I was a teenager not really digging it. I think I was kind of bored by it. Honestly, I think it holds together better now than it did back then. Because when, you know, especially when I was younger, you know, you're so inundated with whatever was coming out at the time. I mean, I was 12 when this came out. I was probably like 14 when I saw it. Um, I think Big Paul, actually, from if you're familiar with Zoobox Goes to the Movies, frequent guest, Big Paul, he rented it. I think he rented it from Blockbuster and we watched it. And both of us were kind of like, eh, this is really cheesy, kind of boring. The movie has kind of a lethargic, episodic, kind of meandering feel to a lot of it. It's not very plot heavy. There isn't a lot of even not even a lot of ton of dialogue, really. It's all just about kind of the place, the atmosphere, the style. It's all about style, you know, and it's very light on story, very light on character development. Now, there is stuff there. And by the time you get to the third act of the movie, it definitely starts kind of becoming more cohesive in that sense, where you feel like there is a little bit more of a direct driving force that maybe you don't feel throughout the rest of the movie. Um, Cause it has kind of a road movie vibe to it kind of, and it's a little lackadaisical and they, they travel from place to place meeting kooky characters and people for the samurai to fight. And uh, you know, their vehicles breaking down then having to walk, you know, it, it goes through all those kind of those things that you might anticipate from a road movie. Um, just with this uh, uh, <laughs> rockabilly post-apocalyptic tinge to it, you know? Um, and it's got a lot of cool stuff. It's very, it's very like Saturday morning cartoon. Honestly, I think like, I think if this had been like a little bit more over the top, it would be like a great kids movie in a weird way. Uh, Cause it's just very simple. All the characters are kind of archetypes, whether they're like, you know, the heroes or the villains and the, the journey that buddy goes on to save this young boy from, from death and his, his metalhead horseman. It's uh you know, it's about him kind of rediscovering humanity, you know, and not being such a loner in the same way that Max does in the Mad Max movies. You know, that's kind of his trajectory as well, even though Max is a little different because he ends up being, you know, he, he still will go off on his own at the end of the movie, he still is truly a loner, but he still understands that parts of society are worth fighting for and worth saving. Whether he really directly wants to do it or not, he does understand that he comes to that understanding. And in this movie, it kind of, it does it in a more dramatic direct way. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff to like about the movie. Uh, the guy who plays it, uh, the, who plays buddy Jeffrey Falcon, Interesting dude. I looked up a little bit of his history. His like IMDb. Uh, this was the last thing he ever did as an actor, as anything. Uh, before this, he was involved in a lot of uh, movies in China, and he would play like you know Thug Number Two, <laughs> uh, 
uh, one of his credits is leader of the robbers, Caucasian killer in a movie, escaped robber leader, thug, another Caucasian killer, fan wielding thug. So he was just involved in the, maybe he was like a stunt man or he's just involved in the action community. Um, and he doesn't even have, well, I'm looking right now. He doesn't even have a ton of like credits, even for stunts or anything like that. He did all this, these, these kind of bits, bit parts in Chinese movies was in a couple. No, it looks like Chinese movies up until six string samurai. It's one of these things. I'm very curious about like what the fuck happened or what his trajectory was. Cause as a lead, I think he does a really good job. And this wasn't like a huge hit. It was, you know, kind of a midnight movie, a festival movie. It was one of those kind of, you could even probably say like in some respect, like, ah, oh, it's kind of like a hipster movie because it's so one note. It's so stylized. It really is just all about the concept. The concept itself is intriguing. And um, I don't know if the director really nails it. I think if this movie was in the hands of a better director, you would have had a much better movie. Like if you think about somebody in a more contemporary sense, somebody like Edgar Wright, somebody has more kind of a visual flourish, more of a a coherent kind of process of making a movie. Like, you know, when he conceptualizes something, whether I like his movies or not, they do feel, they, they feel infused with his personal energy. And this guy, not so much. I mean, I think, you know, part of that is on purpose because it's also, while it's pulling from Mad Max and stuff, it also feels like it's pulling from spaghetti westerns. You know, he could be also kind of goes in hand in hand with somebody like uh, like Clint Eastwood, the, the man with no name from uh, those old spaghetti westerns from the 60s. Right. And that's also what Max is slightly based on as well. So it makes sense so that you could you can actually follow the line, the lineage of this kind of a character. Um, there's even in the movie, there's even a guy who's like kind of a, a cameo ass dude. Who's like a stand in for Clint Eastwood. It's actually a pretty funny, a pretty funny moment. Um, but yeah, I, I wish it, the direction was a little stronger and I wish that the, the fight choreography and that the fight, the way they shot the fighting was better because it feels super underwhelming. It doesn't really start taking hold until the end because at, by the end of the movie, there's more dramatic stakes in what you're watching. Um, but it could have used a little style, you know, it could have used a little help in that sense. Right. It would have been cool to like, kind of in the same way that, ah, oh, what's the hell is it called? Takashi Meek made this movie in the early two thousands. It's like Sakuya Western Django. Quentin Tarantino is actually in it. He's like the storyteller. He's this guy that kind of bookends the movie and he's like at a campfire telling this story. And that is kind of, uh, would be something akin to what six string samurai could have been. Also, I would, another movie, this is a Korean movie called, uh, the good, the bad and the weird. I can't remember who directed that, so, but it came out in the mid two thousands. I think mid to almost maybe 2010 ish, 2008, 2009. Uh, that also kind of has a similar tone to this, but it has more of a creative spark from the direction. And that, if I had my major complaint with this movie, is that. Because it is so bare. Because it is so straightforward. There isn't, like, a lot of subtext. There's not a lot of nuance. I mean, there's there are things in it. You know, they're literally fighting somebody called death. I feel like that's, like, it's kind of a nod to where the world's at. Like, this, the struggle that Buddy... And this kid are going on and kind of reclaiming his humanity to a certain degree is a microcosm of what's going on in the whole entire world right now, especially in Nevada or Las Vegas in this area. It encapsulates kind of the fight to survive the fight for humanity's soul in some kind of larger, broader context, right? In a metaphorical sense. You know, will we just become fucking nomads? Will we become just like selfish, self-serving assholes that just destroy people for our own benefit? Or will we find uh, a common spirit with others and kind of try to rise to the occasion to fight back against all these kind of primal, primal desires to survive? That's what I got from it anyways. Uh, it's it's interesting. It's also if you look at like the IMDb, it's it's um 
Oh no, it's not there. I've heard this described as like a musical because there's uh, there's a few sequences where there's well there's rockabilly music all throughout the movie, but towards the end of the movie, they actually has like a a fucking like shred off with with death, and I wish that that was more of a part of the movie because he he has his you know his guitar his hollow body electric guitar, and it's kind of like his Excalibur to a certain extent. That's what it feels like, and people are trying to steal it from him and whatnot. And I wish that like it had been a little bit more overtly about that. And like, that is kind of like his sense of expression. Cause he's such a, he's a guy of so few words that if, if they had kind of been able to build this sort of parallel between like his voice being something that is serviced through the instrument. And that's how he kind of inspires people. That's how he fights back against evil. And they kind of do that at the end. I just wish that it, it was a thread that was tied a little tighter throughout the rest of the story. So it felt like when it happens at the end, it's like this big climactic moment. Like, Oh my God. Like, Oh my God. He plays the fucking, the siren song for humanity in a positive way, not in a negative way. <laughs> the soothsayer song will say, um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I uh, I will say this. I really enjoyed it. I watched it actually with my son. He's like, you know, he's three and a half, almost four. Getting close to four anyways, like five months away. And uh, he had a good time too. We both we both were <laughs> pretty engaged by it, you know. And which was, I was surprised that he liked it so much or he was into it so much because of how, like I said, like lackadaisical it is. It doesn't feel very propulsive for kind of a long time in the movie. It doesn't, I don't, I would say that even at 90 minutes, it does feel a little long. And again, I think that goes to part of that's the direction. It's not, it's not so much the vision, the concept, like all those things are interesting. I think there is some sort of archetypal stuff going on. Like I just described, um, but the direction definitely did let it down a little bit. And that, I don't mean, I don't know if it makes sense, but the guy who directed this, this was his first feature film and he's only done one other, uh, fiction feature film. It was, uh, the crow wicked prayer. The one with Edward Furlong and David Boreanaz, Tara Reed, the direct to video crow sequel. Um, that's the only other fiction movie he's made. And that was in what? 2005. And he's done a couple documentaries. He did one called In Time, the Delgado Brothers Story, and then Third Eye Spies, which Third Eye Spies, I believe, is on Amazon Prime. So if you have Amazon Prime, you can check it out. And that seems like an interesting documentary. I might check it out. It's called, it's a, the plot description is, two physicists discover psychic abilities are real only to have their experiments at Stanford co-opted by the CIA and their research silenced by the demands of secrecy. Skip Atwater is one of the subjects. Yuri Geller. Could be interesting. That might be an interesting thing. It might be worth checking out. I don't know. I might do it. Might hit it up this afternoon. I don't know. But yeah. But thanks for uh, thanks Fractal. Thanks for making the suggestion. I really enjoyed the revisit. Um, not a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely an interesting one. It's a worthy kind of part of film history in the film canon. And uh, it seems like it's a little bit forgotten. I know it's always been kind of a cult classic, but the fact that it never even made the leap to high def, like, and it's not streaming anywhere. That's why physical media, everybody, you got to buy this shit. You got to do it because <laughs> it's not always going to be there. Something like six string samurai could very well be forgotten. Could very well be forgotten. If it doesn't make the leap, I'm hoping that like a, some boutique label, like Shout Factory or Arrow or something like that. Maybe uh, Kino Lorber. Maybe they, if they would pick it up and restore it and uh, get some behind the scenes stuff, get some, get some interviews. Like, what the hell happened to Jeffrey Falcon? What the fuck happened? How did he end up in Six String Samurai? And then how, on top of that, then what happened to his career afterwards? I was talking to a guy on Twitter about it, and he's like, I think he started a business in China. He's like an entrepreneur. That's what happened to him. That was his life. And he goes back and forth between America and China. That's, you know, that's what I heard. That's what I heard on the internet. No confirmation of, of the truth of these things. But, uh, yeah. Anyways, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to know more about Zoobox, there's a bunch of links in the description for Facebook, for Instagram, for my Twitter, for my brother Dan's Twitter. Also, just like I just did today, if you want to make a recommendation for one of these videos, by all means, do it. Throw it in the comments. I'm more than happy to uh, 
take a look at whatever you guys want to hear me talk about. I, I don't know why you would. I ramble. <laughs> some, some of these are better than others, but I'm more than happy to do it. All right, everybody. You have the best day ever. Goodbye.